of 1% extra credit. I'm replacing that whole lecture quiz thing with just like a, you showed up today, so thank you very much. To collect your extra credit, please go ahead and either take that bit.ly link or use the QR code to get you to the link and just put your name in on the form, okay? So I, any one of those things, uh, either your name, your PID, your email, if you're logging in with UCSD, all of those will enable us to get the right points to you. But uh, the more you enter, then the more uh, likely it is that there won't be a mistake and you'll get your extra credit point. Okay? So unlike what I said earlier, I will make this whole recording available to everybody, but this extra credit form is only going to be live during the lecture and for an hour after the lecture, okay? So everybody who isn't able to make it today will still be able to uh, do the lecture quiz, but they will not be able to get this extra credit point. So only those of you who made the effort to show up, either on Zoom or here live, will be able to do that. Okay, so uh, is, every, is anybody still scrambling to get the bit.ly link? Okay, so you're all too young to remember a time without a map on your smartphone. But believe it or not, there was a time when people were arguing about what the heck these smartphones are for. And the big, the big kind of uh, thought at the time was that maps, online maps, were this killer app that were going to be able to finally, you know, make sure that everybody needed to have this phone in their pocket. And, uh, well, it turned out to be true, right? And I'll argue with you that maps were the killer app well before there was a smartphone. The first real epidemiology was done by this dude named John Snow in 1854. No, not that John Snow, okay? This John Snow, the uh, personal physician to Queen Victoria, who, unlike most people, thought that sicknesses like cholera were not caused by foul air or by a miasma but he thought it was actually something going on in the water. So when there was this huge cholera outbreak in London, he went door to door and he mapped who was sick in which location. And in doing that, he figured out that lo and behold, there was this one water pump that was responsible for this cholera outbreak. And he was able to stop it by removing the handle from the pump. So maps literally are the killer app. Okay, this is something that just came into my, uh, my social media feed literally yesterday. It shows that the uh, ancient sea uh, location, the, the beach, the area between the land and the ocean, is the reason why we have a blue streak going across Alabama today in politics, right? 100 million years ago, this, this coastline deposited a bunch of stuff here which created the fertile black land belt in the uh, south, right? Which is where, of course, slaves were being held in 1860 to work those farms, which influences where the modern black population is and therefore the election results. So this just kind of really illustrates the power of putting information into maps. Well, our guest today, Ari Isaac, is the CEO of Ivari GIS Consulting, a firm that does this kind of geographic information, right? And mostly they do it in the service of civic in infrastructure. They're particularly interested in uh, smart cities and how various uh, internet of things kind of stuff can help keep things running. Uh, he's gonna tell you all about that cool stuff Ari's got a background actually in uh, 
environmental science and then got into GIS in the service of that kind of thing. So I imagine he might tell you a little bit about that journey too. So everybody, please welcome Ari Isaac. tried this out last time, so it might take a second. Okay. This is a cool, this is a neat thing. So my wife is a college professor, so I need you guys all to um, in, indulge me in taking one of those photos like you do at a concert with all the people in the background so I can show her because she teaches at USD and uh, there are a lot more students here than there would be at USD, so I need to like show her up. Okay, everybody ready? Like we're at a show. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Um, so let's do a, so my computer's doing it. It's restarting, but after it restarted, it found the, it found the screen. Anyway, um, let's get into the, okay, now I gotta not deal with that. Sorry for the technical difficulties. There's nothing like doing a live performance, is there? All right, so maybe while this is starting, we can just run through, I know that there's a whole series of different majors in the room, maybe we can like cover what the, the biggest group of people, biggest group of majors are. I don't know what they are, but maybe you guys can like scream them out, if you know. Computer science. Woo! Yeah, computer science. How who, <laughs> who, who else is, what other majors are in the room? Science. Comp sci. Comp sci. Okay, sounds really, sounds great. Any other big ones? Anybody here that's like a writing major or history? No? Data science, okay, cool. All right. All right, I think we're sort of there. So I wanted to start this off just by saying I wasn't a very good student. I wouldn't have gotten in here. Um, I was, very interested in having fun in, in high school in high school and college. Um, and uh, so, and this presentation isn't, um, I'm not overly technical. I've hired folks that work for me that are very technical. We have a, a whole IT team. Um, so you may ask me technical questions and I may be like, I need to get back to you on that. Um, but I quickly wanted to cover um, my story. So, cause I know that all of you are getting ready to graduate here sometime in the next year, a few years, and um, so that you can just know, like mine, everybody has their own path. Um, I went to the University of Redlands, um, which is about a third of the way from here to Vegas, in the middle of nowhere, east of LA, um, and uh, I majored in environmental studies. It was actually an independent, st independent study major, on, it was called marine conservation biology, where we were I was interested in the ocean and um, marine habitats. Uh, and I got out of school and um, I couldn't find a job. I thought I wanted to be somebody who was like counting salmon or you know, that kind of stuff, uh, environmental work. Um, I specifically did not want to sit behind a computer all day. Now I sit behind a computer all day today. I assume many of you do too. Um, but uh, I got out of school and my dad said, go find a technical skill that matches your 
interest to, to make you more marketable. So I did GIS, um, and uh, I got a job at a place called Aerial Information Systems for three years, where I, where I call it a GIS sweatshop, where you're basically sitting there drawing lines on a map. Um, you know, this is, a sh this is a shopping center, this is a bunch of duplexes, this is a college, this is a, um, a military installation, there's all kinds of uh, land use classifications. I also did hydrology of all of New Jersey, and you sit for months and months drawing lines and giving things attributes. Um, let, me, let me just turn that off. Um, so I did that for three years. You'll never believe this, but that got a little boring. Um, and I got a job for Helix Environmental Planning, which is here in La Mesa. And they, um, they uh, get projects approved for uh, large construction projects. Like if you're driving out the 15, there's all these like houses uh, on the 15 uh, if you're driving north. Um, a lot of that was permitted by Helix Environmental Planning. So we were creating reports to get construction projects done. And I would create the maps that would end up in the reports. That was cool for a few years, but then I realized I'm never going to be able to. I had an opportunity to get back into environmental, and I chose to do GIS work, uh, continue with GIS work. Um, and I also realized that I was never going to be anything more than a uh, graphics design person that creates maps using GIS. And I knew GIS had a lot more. By the way, in the, back there, I did a, an internship. I also did, I went to UCR Extension and got a certificate in GIS. Um, then I, um, I got a job at the Port of San Diego. I was the GIS coordinator at the Port of San Diego for four years, um, where I got to really do enterprise GIS and learn all about the various departments um, and what they needed and working with them to build applications that were helpful for them. They have harbor police. They have a uh, real estate department, really. The, the, the job of the Port of San Diego is to lease land that's owned by the port uh, on port property. Um, you know, the Sheraton that's down there, the convention center, all that's leased uh, to the Port of San Diego. Um, there's an engineering department, all that kind of good stuff. So I would really work closely with them to, to build applications that made, that made life useful for them. Um, and then I got uh, sort of bored with that. Um, and because, largely because my boss wasn't a GIS person, um, and I also realized that I was only going to, working for the government, you, you, they, at the port anyway, you make 4% a year. I knew what I was gonna, I knew what I came in at. I knew I was gonna get a 4% raise every year. And um, I wasn't real happy with that situation. I also, I, I was moonlighting at the time. I had a website and somebody contacted me and I ended up, uh, someone contacted me about a job in San Diego to help convert the street lights to LED. There was a GIS scope in the, in the contract and I, um, I bid with them and I won it. And, uh, I was basically, I won the amount of work that I was making from the port, and I was just like, forget the port, I'm just gonna do my own thing. It was a terribly risky situation. I didn't think about it at the time, but you know, you have to have workman's comp insurance and all this other stuff as a business that you don't have to have as an employee. Um, uh, I also had you know, a newborn, so um, I took a risk. My wife, I wouldn't have made it without my wife you know, being with me and saying, you know, you can make this happen, I believe in you. Um, and then, so I started Ivari GIS Consulting. So we've been going for 12 years. Our main bread and butter is street lighting, supporting street lighting conversions to LED across the United States. We've helped convert San Diego, uh, not only San Diego's uh, street lighting to induction, which happened in 2011, but also um, a 5G rollout for Verizon. We had to also audit all the street lights, 5G networks are you know, go on the streetlights and they need line of sight, which is a huge geography problem, right? What is the line of sight for every streetlight in San Diego or which, which streetlight should we install, should Verizon invest in, in order to deploy the 5G network? Um, we've also done Phoenix, Chicago, San Francisco, Fresno. We recently won Boston and Philadelphia, so 2022 is looking up. We also do lots of smaller cities. Right now we have people in uh, for a utility that's east of um, Austin and north of San Antonio, which um, is not as urban as you'd think it would be. <laughs> um, it's pretty spread out, um, and there's everything you'd think is happening if you were to send 
uh, you know, people around with cameras to take photos of streetlights in rural Texas. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a risky component to it. Um, and we also have people in uh, Tennessee outside of Memphis. Um, so anyway, um, that's me. And can everybody hear okay? Okay, so everybody feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, that's me. Uh, I started, so then there's sort of like, you don't realize this, but you'll actually change your career multiple times in your life. So I've been a GIS professional, but a different type of GIS professional throughout my career. First, I was a GIS sweatshop monkey, and then I was a graphics design GIS guy, and then I was an enterprise GIS uh, professional, and then I was a small business owner that basically does everything, including the GIS. So I was doing all the IT, all the, all the business development, all the operations, um, and then slowly I let each of those jobs go. I hired people, so we have four, four managers who do a lot of the things that I, I did do at the beginning. Um, and so um, I've done all those jobs. So now what's happened is, now that I have those people in place, my last step or my most recent step is what I wanna work on, which is basically building a startup within Ivari GIS Consulting to give Ivari GIS Consulting a competitive advantage in the market. So I am a, the Director of Innovation and Strategy at Ivari GIS Consulting now, but before I was the founder and CEO. Um, which change your, if you're getting a lot of spam, it's because your job title is too good. Change it and you'll get a lot less spam. So, uh, okay, all right. So I, I think I covered the first one there. So what drives me? Um, my, my father's a rabbi, um, and so uh, he, often there were like challenges that he needed to deal with. At one point when I was a kid, there was a family that, you know, the, one of the kids was playing with matches or whatever and burned the family house down, you know, and they were a member of the congregation. Obviously my dad played a role in helping this family, and you know, so I have a very strong sort of civic uh, interest in public good, and doing, doing the right things. At Ivari GIS Consulting, we don't, we, don't do, we don't work on widening freeways. We don't work on oil exploration. Um, we're not interested in that. We're interested in things that we can do to help uh, push society uh, forward. Uh, you know, I don't, which I think converting streetlights to LED saves a ton of energy, saves a ton of CO2 uh, emissions, GHG emissions. And um, we're very happy to participate participate in that. Also, it creates safety. Yeah. Yeah. How hard has it been? Uh, it, uh, it hasn't been hard because we've We, we, I don't know that I've necessarily run into a challenge like a, like, a, like a personal, you know, conflict where I could accept some position that would make me um, sacrifice my values. It, like the million dollar deal where, you know, you know that would be, you know, a, a half a year worth of income for the business to do oil exploration. We've never run a, I've never had to deal with that personally. Um, but uh, we, we would, we wouldn't do it. We would just do the things that we're good at and the things that we're interested in, which is, you know, I consider myself like a climate warrior um, and um, someone who wants to create complete streets and, you know, uh, move people to biking and help the city achieve their climate action plan goals. And I mean, I also, I don't market myself to oil exploration people either. You know, I go to the street and area lighting conference, I go to energy conferences, and I network with people who are in that industry. And so that, so there are, I, I just, I don't find myself with a, with a moral issue. I haven't found myself um, yet. Hopefully I won't. Um, so uh, that drives me. I also, I really like building stuff. Like I really like finding value. So in business, you can't, 
Like if you're bringing $100,000 worth of value to a client, you can't take away, you can't charge $100,000 for that. You need to bring value to the person you're working for. So if you're bringing $100,000 worth of value in terms of their ability to make better decisions, in terms of their ability to make less better choices, in terms of their, you know, if, if we go out and audit a whole bunch of streetlights, they know what, um, they know what they're ordering. They don't have to deal with problems in the field. So if we're saving them $100,000, we may only charge them fifty dollars or $30,000. Um, and so what I really enjoy is thinking about this idea of how can I bring as much value to our customers as possible. And that is very, very different than just doing what they tell you to do. That's doing what they tell you to do is something else. That's, that's like being an employee. Um, so. Uh, so that, and that's really the impetus behind me becoming the director of innovation and strategy, which is I want to build new things that are outside of what our customers are actually asking for. And I'm going to show you a couple of those things. And I also want to talk about this major problem in IT. So my IT director, director of IT, is he's a, he's a coach, like a basketball coach. And his job is to bring out the best in our employees so that they can perform at levels that are you know, higher than even that employee may expect. And whether it's JavaScript development or managing servers or whatever it is, he needs to bring out the best in those people and make them as valuable as possible. My director of operations is similar, except he's more dealing with the clients and, and, and interpersonal relationships associated with speaking with clients and, and managing expectations and all of that kind of good stuff. My director of business development, he is a, um, his job is to set us up to win. His job is to write proposals about fairly technical, con regarding fairly technical concepts that, uh, and make that as easy as possible for people who are, you know, um, managers for large companies or chasing large jobs. Like Philadelphia is 125,000 streetlights. Overall, it might be a $100 million job. The person who's chasing that for the prime contractor, you know, he's not understanding databases. He doesn't understand a relational database. He doesn't understand JavaScript versus C Sharp. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't understand any of that. So you need, you need to be, he needs to be able to take these challenging technical concepts and make them easy. And the problem in IT, and the problem that we consistently have with our newer employees, is that they seem to think that they're going to get by with just the technical skills. But in reality, and I hate to break it to you, I know that you're working on your technical skills right now, but in reality is those technical skills can be commoditized. There's, it's like money. There's always someone with more money. <laughs> there's always a better JavaScript developer. There's always a better DBA. There's always a better um, you know, deep learning professional. Uh, uh, in the world, right? And, and so it's very hard to get by solely upon your ability to do technical work. What makes the difference is, can you be the technical person plus the coach? Because you really need both to be talented. Can you be the technical person plus the person who can sell GIS consulting services? and make life easy and do presentations and that kind of stuff. You know, can you be um, people who can build relationships with clients where the client says, I want to work with that guy, you know, because I worked with him on a previous project and he's awesome and I want to work with him. You know, um, just, you know, if you think you're going to sit behind a desk and solve technical problems, you may be great at that and that may work really well for you, you know, and tech bro world may, may work out great for you, but, but I would suggest that it's relationships that really make the difference. So that's the problem that I see in IT world. Anybody want to argue with me about that? No? <laughs> OK. So we're going to do some GIS 101, and then we're going to talk about two ideas that Ivari uh, Labs, which is the, um, the innovative startup within Ivari GIS Consulting is working on, and why. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you want to delve into anything in particular. So what is GIS? A GIS is a tool for gathering, managing, analyzing, and presenting geographic data. 
So the classic question is, is Google Maps a GIS? And I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to give it a caveat. So Google Maps is great for solving specific problems, like I'm at a conference in Kansas City, and I really want to eat Italian food. What Italian food is close to my hotel? Right, that's a geographic question, and Google Maps is set up to help you solve that question. But there are a million other questions like, what, uh, which pipes are feeding this school where I um, you know, witnessed you know, high lead volume, high lead content in the school's drinking water? Right? Google Maps is not the place to help you solve that type of custom problem. You know, GIS is, and in GIS world, there's really the open source world and the Esri world. Uh, uh, both are good. We, we use the Esri world. Um, but um, Google, understand that Google Maps is, is not there to solve everything. It's, you're the customer, right? You're the one that's using it. Um, and trying to solve you know, which street lights are within District 5 in Milwaukee is not going to is not going to be is not going to be easy to solve in Google Maps. How, how many street lights or what are the wattages of those street lights? So, all right. So here we go. GIS 101. So it's a mature uh, IT system that fits alongside in an enterprise environment like the Port of San Diego or whatever. It would fit alongside a document management system and ERP like SAP. Um, uh, all, all kinds of various systems that are there to help solve specific types of problems. Your document management system is there to help you um, keep track of all your enterprise documents. GIS is there to help you solve your geography questions, right? You may have a viewer that in SAP that shows where points are, but again, it's not going to be able to uh, uh, solve your questions about how many points are within a certain distance of every school in San Diego. Those type of detailed questions are not going to be, you're not going to be able to solve easily within SAP. So it's really about those geographic relationships that are solved within an enterprise GIS. And how that works is you have features, which are points, lines, and polygons, and those exist on a map. And then you have attributes, which are your table that live in the background, the table. All of this information can live in uh, SQL Server, Oracle, all that other kind of stuff. There's all kinds of web APIs that can you know, interact with this, uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, uh, everything else. Um, so, and then there, so, there's, so that's vector data, point lines and polygons. And then you have raster data, which is a grid of, um, a grid of values that have you know, uh, points, and I'll, I'll show you one of those later. And each of the, a grid of values and each grid point, each grid has a, like an aerial photo is a raster image. And in each cell, it's holding an RGB value. So it's, a, it's what they call a three band raster image and it holds an R value, a GB value, uh, and a G value. And that's how the aerial photo is shown. And then you might put streets on top of that which, or rivers, which would be represented as lines. And you might put um, you know, your, your polygons that it's showing there, which are parcels. All right. So I'm going to go into the first thing that we are offering. You'll, you'll forgive me. I put this presentation together last night um, if I was bidding a huge job. Oh, geez. If I was bidding a huge job, I would um, I would have done a better presentation, but
Now, hopefully it logged in there. I'm not sure what happened. All right, so we're working on two primary efforts. I'm gonna tell you the one I think you're gonna be least, interest in, least interested in first so that we can save the best for last. Um, this is called Ivari Lux. Um, how it works is uh, there are lighting, all of these lights have what's called an IS value file, and it describes the horizontal and vertical angles and the intensity with which the light leaves this, a fixture. Obviously, we're interested in street lighting, but this room was designed by a lighting professional who used these IES files to understand how the light is all organized here. The light bounces off the walls and everything else, and so this is supposed to be conducive to learning, and um, it was designed by somebody spent you know, hours and hours describing the lighting. This wasn't just like thrown in here. Um, anyway, with street lighting, um, what they do is they divide a dynamic major city into um, what they call typicals, like eight typicals, which is like a local collector intersection. And then, so that might be a typical, and then they would design a local collector intersection, then they'll apply that local collector intersection to every in local collector intersection in the city of San Diego. Well, sometimes road widths are, di are different. Sometimes there's a bike lane, sometimes there's all kinds of variables. Sometimes they're, you know, the, 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 the intersection doesn't meet at uh, right angles. Sometimes um, it's only a three-way intersection, right? And so it's my, I assert that the lighting industry is not doing the best that they can to design lighting specifically for what's going on on the ground. And GIS is a way to help do that. And what we need to do is grab the IES file for the street lights and put it, bring it into a GIS environment, right? So we start with the, where the pole meets the ground, okay, and then we figure out the luminaire height. We can collect this all during the audit, and then we add the mast arm. And so by the way, we're talking about street lighting, not traffic signals, okay, and then See where the triangle is? That's where the street light is, and then we know the direction that the street light's in. And then we understand the horizontal and vertical angles and the direction with which the light is leaving. So this is all the light at 50 lux. So lux is the way that you, you measure street lights. Um, and then so we have, we have these, and then we have what we call a volume. So this is the, the light, how the light is above a specific Lux value, okay? So here's the rays at one lux. These are the rays, some of them are hitting the ground, some of them are not hitting the ground. Um, and then we account for the, where the rays hit the ground. And you can see there's these red dots, or points. Um, and you can see that the lux value on the ground here is 0.55, and the initial luminous intensity, which was the from the IES file was 216, and it traveled 64 feet, and light loses intensity as it travels, but we know it's 64 feet, so uh, based on what's called the inverse square law, we can figure out what the light is on the ground. Okay, and then here's a street light and our, and our, um, our points on the ground. And then from there, what we can do is we can create an illumination surface, and sometimes this takes a second to go in. So using interpolation, we can determine the values between all these points in order to create a seamless surface. Now we can do this for 60,000 streetlights in San Jose across the entire city of San Jose. Um, and what we do is we do this for each streetlight, and then we add all of the rasters together if they overlap. All right, so that's what an illumination surface looks like, and this is, this is a raster, just like your aerial photo, and the pixel value, where the pixel value, instead of it being an RGB value, it holds 4.2. 
So um, we're hopeful that this, uh, and then we can create what are called calculation points. These are points in a 10 by 10 grid. We can create ISO lines, which are basically contours of those variables, and then we can look across, we can look across an entire city and look at this from an entire city perspective so that we can do things like, that we could never do before, like let's look at a bike lane and figure out what the average, um, you know, lux value is throughout the bike lane for every calculation point that, that falls within the bike lane. So that's one of the things that we're working on now. We are gonna do this for the city of Philadelphia. We've never done it for anywhere. We've done it for um, uh, San Jose, but we didn't do it under a project for San Jose. We just did it. But it was, it was considered a competitive advantage for the team that we bid with and the team won. So I don't know if it was due to our ability to bring this thing to the table. I mean, I can't imagine that it swayed a $100 million deal, but um, maybe, right? Who knows? Okay, so that's Ivari Lux. Anybody have any questions about Ivari Lux? There's a lot of hocus pocus about measuring light. If you find yourself wanting to measure light, it's, it's not straightforward. Color plays a huge role. Like these are lighter, these are uh, um, not a white light. And so you might have actually more light than if you were to transfer this to another color light. Anyway, there's a lot there. I've done a lot with light. But let's get into the thing I think that you're going to care about. Okay, now I'm going to do the opposite of what most people do in presentations. Everybody take out your phone. Okay. Now I want you to look on your, I want to open, open your pictures and skip the picture of your girlfriend and skip the picture of you and your buddies partying last night um, and try to find a picture that you took because it was easy to take a picture of something in order to remember it. Like, right, Amazon does this. They take a picture at your, at your doorstep or what? I don't know if you guys even have doorsteps, but um, does anybody have an example of a picture they're willing to share where they took the picture, but the purpose of taking the picture was to remember something? Yeah. Oh, to, to, docu to document it so you could show the picture. You could describe it in words, but that would have been lame. Yeah, exactly. Right? Anybody else have an example? Okay, orange or yellow shirt. What is it? Oh, you guys excited about the trolley? <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about it too. Um, we were involved in one of the, the planning districts, not for this one, but Morena. So um, we're sort of, we were sort of involved in that. So remember before we talked about basic GIS was points, lines, and polygons, and then an attribute table that was associated with the points, lines, and polygons, right? So every point has a row in the attribute table. Every Polygon has a row in the attribute table. Anyway, um, what about photos? Why are photos, we think that photos are a third data type that could be associated with this. So you should have one, you should have a point, a feature, a, street, a point that represents a street light, a column that has attributes, and then photos that are aligned with that street light that are collected in the field. Right? We don't do this in GIS these days. We don't really do it in IT that much, I don't think. So we built this system where you can take a photo, and it's a very specific photo. So we have these people in the field, and they take photos. Of, we're going to walk the entire city of Philadelphia, and we're going to take photos of every single streetlight in Philadelphia, and they're going to. we built an app in order to take the photo. And then um, those photos are going to sync to the cloud, and then we have another app that we use to classify the photos and pull the data from the photos. And then that gets synced back to the database. So this is a LPS, uh, 
cast iron, I believe it's a cast iron pole that's painted green. So those are all attributes that need to end up in the database, but we can use the photo to do that instead of just entering the data in the field. Now what's the difference? Why, why, do, we, why, is, why do we care about going that route instead of just entering the data in the field? Because entering data in the field means that that person in the field needs to be trained to identify a cast iron pole versus a whatever, fiberglass pole or whatever else, or a LPS head versus a HPS head. There's a lot of logic there, and we want to hire people locally, and we want them to be effective as quickly as possible. So what we've done is we can, we've trained them, we've built a system where largely they just take photos. They got to go out to the street light, they create the point, then they take the very specific photos that, are, that go to the back end where we can classify the photos and get the attribute table. So we, we, we pull the photo from, we pull the data from the photo. Clients love this because they get the photo, right? Before they didn't, wouldn't get the photo. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my next slide. <laughs> um, so right, so these are all different kind of attributes on the left and the photo on the right. Um, yes. So here we go. This is what we call Ivari Plus, which is photo-driven data collection, right? So we got the guy in the field takes the photo, okay? Then the we confirm the photo is good. And we do that by using the EXIF information that's in the photo and confirming that it covers the right thing. And we also, the Ivari camera app names the photo specifically so that they are taking like an up photo or a full photo, and I'll, I'll show that in a minute. But then we can go through three different vertical ways of getting that data into the database, right? The first is a human being can look at the photo and enter data into the database which is faster than doing it in the field, but not as fast as the other two ways. Then we have crowdsourcing, which could be Mechanical Turk. I'm assuming you guys know what Mechanical Turk is? No. So Mechanical Turk are people that you can hire to do basically, they call it artificial, artificial intelligence, right? So they're people that do artificial intelligence type work. Am I, am I on time? It's coming, getting close. Yes, I will do that. All right, and then obviously there's Amazon recognition and custom vision through Azure. You might be familiar with that, but these are actual AIs that can identify patterns in photos and give you back information. What you need to do is train them to learn what a cast iron streetlight looks like or what an LPS streetlight looks like, and then you can feed, once you have that model built, you can feed other photos in and it will tell you with some accuracy, um, whether, whether, you're, whether you're good. So we've basically built three assembly lines. The first is take the photo, right? We've made life easier for the folks in the field that are taking the photo. These are various photos that we take. A full photo, an up photo, an issue photo. We, take, we don't just take them and name them all the same because we use each photo to train a different AI, right? The full photo or, or the up photo can train, you can train the AI to learn that that sticker on the underside of the street light there, I don't know if you can see it. There's a little sticker, you can't see it. But maybe you could train that photo to recognize the little sticker. Or you could train that photo to distinguish between that HPS versus an LPS versus a LED, right? Um, and if you have lots of photos like that, that might be easy. All right, the next assembly line is where we feed these photos to a human being that makes a decision. Does that human being need to be in the office? Someone who's looked at these photos before? Can we just give it to anybody? Um, but it's, it's another uh, piece of the assembly line. And then this is to prove that the data is actually accurate. If we're classifying things like overhead lines, there's never gonna be an over, a street light that's fed overhead that's all by itself. So we look at it on a map and we make sure that there's a straight line of um, street lights. Uh, anyway, um, I hope that's the end of the slides. Um, we've done this for about a year. We'll take over a thousand photos today. We took over a thousand photos yesterday. 
we'll take a thousand photos tomorrow. I mean, we might have a million photos. The city of San Jose has 70,000 streetlights. We have three high resolution photos of every single streetlight. But more importantly than that, they're all classified because we needed to get the data right. So we have this framework to train the AI. We need to work on that and do, do a better job of it. Um, but uh, that's, that's what I'm working on, because I'd, like I'd like to obviously use the AI. The AI is, um, if I could get it to work, it would be very valuable to us, because it's faster, it's more reliable than, than a human being. Anybody have any questions? That's it. Yeah. Oh, you mean the picture of Tanner, who's looked at every single photo in San Jose? So yeah, so there's positive Tanner and negative Tanner. Positive Tanner classifies a photo in the first place, and negative Tanner confirms that the photo was classified properly. So the difference between going through a whole bunch of photos and saying, wood pole, concrete, cast iron, and classifying them versus Somebody else already said wood pole. I'm, I'm going to go through all the wood poles and just go wood, 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 cast iron, you know, and disagree with the previous decision because we need corroboration in order to make it, in order to ensure that it's accurate. So that's negative Tanner. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, by f the most expensive piece of our work is getting people in the field, paying for gas, training them, paying hours for people to walk around and collect this information as quickly and as accurately as possible. We don't pay people. We pay people hourly so, so that they don't rush. If something takes a little bit longer, you, know, you need to park and then walk a little bit to do things safely then you should, we, that's why we pay people hourly. Other companies that do what we do sometimes pay people on a per light basis, and they're like, oh, you could make a million dollars a day, you know, but you have to field check, you know, you've got to like park in the middle lane. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not an expert at this, but in GIS world, they call this image augmentation, uh, where you can like identify the background and then swap out the background for like nighttime, or swap out the background for a farm, and or stretch the image by 20% or 40%. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, I've tried to do stuff like that, but honestly, we haven't been that successful with Azure, particularly. Uh, Amazon recognition was more expensive. Um, and it didn't seem to do anything different than Azure, and it didn't seem to perform any better. Um, but, I mean, this is a technical skill that we'd love to, you know, work with you. I mean, we have, if you'd like access to a million photos of streetlights that are all classified, we'd love for you to play around with it. Any other questions? So you're all going to be GIS folks, right? Huh? Yeah, GIS, maps. Data, S3, Amazon. All right, well, I think we're, oh. So, um, so Ari, you, um, but I think, I think you said that there at the end, but just in general, it seems like your company may have projects where people who are interested in GIS stuff, is that right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we definitely have uh, technical challenges. We always have technical challenges to overcome. It's never just, you know, I don't really, I'm not interested in working in a place where it's like, you know, just day in, day out doing the same thing. So uh, new challenges every day. Clients give us new challenges. Um, you guys should all connect to me on LinkedIn. Um, just send me an email, say I was in Dr. Fleischer's class, um, and uh, you know, we can keep in touch, and if things 
you know, maybe I'll run into a job posting that's interesting for you, or maybe opportunity will show up at Ivari, and you know, I'm happy to facilitate that. Another thing we do is um, we do what's called um, coffees, and it's not a job interview, but if you would like to get a coffee with my um, director of operations and my director of IT, they are interested in meeting smart people, not just to get to know smart people, and it's not that there's a job posting available, but it, they're interested in learning about what you're working on. They'll share what they're working on. We can do it virtually. Um, so email me, connect to me on LinkedIn, email me if you'd like to do a coffee with my director of IT and my director of operations, because they're the ones that are really the folks who would make decisions about you know, hiring you or they're plugged into the right communities. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey everybody, just a reminder, there is of course your data checkpoint or your EDA checkpoint on your project, so please don't forget about that. And uh, we will talk with you on Monday. Thank you everybody.